by Zoom bombing this this conversation about about mountain biking. Um, and I'll tell you why. So a few years ago, I was working with the, the White Mountain National Forest, and we got we assembled a meeting for the bike clubs and chapters uh, and the ski areas that were directly adjacent to them. And the, the ski areas were developing projects, developing trails. The bike clubs were as well, but they weren't necessarily talking to each other. And we saw a huge value in bringing people into the same room just for conversation. And we did that over the course of three days in person, and it was a huge success. Um, the, the Forest Service, one of the ways that we were able to make it happen was we utilized a national partnership that we had with the International Mountain Bike Association, IMBA, to facilitate and help plan that, that workshop. So when we wrapped up in New Hampshire, we had some money left over. And we wanted to do something similar in Vermont. So I asked the folks at IMBA if they'd be willing to continue in Vermont. I teamed up with my partner on the Green Mountain National Forest, Holly Knox, who many of you know. And we started trying to engage a, a, a broader community. Um, we in, engaged VIMBA and Vermont Forest Parks and Rec early on, and then solicited um, feedback from a lot of the clubs for what do people need? And what we came up with was some space for people to, to have discussions, quite frankly, um, just room for conversation about some of the lessons learned, um, some of the, the, the visions that may be shared between different players in the community and just conversations about who we are and, and what we want to be. Um, we're, we're super grateful to have these three agencies or organizations hosting. One is the Forest Service, the second is Vermont Forest Parks and Rec, and third one, VIMBA. And we're also really excited to have IMBA facilitating this series as well. Um, we're gonna quickly, uh, we'll transition over to IMBA staff, um, Steve Kasachik and John Cox, who are gonna be helping facilitate this session and, and the, the following sessions in the series. Um, but before we do that, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the Green Mountain National Forest and the Forest Service and their role. It's 400,000 acres spread out over the state of Vermont some great riding and really varied riding from um, rugged kind of historic single track to lift serve at places like Sugarbush and Mount Snow. Um, some really amazing terrain, places like the Rochester Valley, Moose Lamu, um, some great trails and some great staff that, that wanna work with partners to offer up um, really top-notch mountain bike opportunities. We also have um, with us tonight, Becca Washburn, who is the Director of Lands Administration for Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. And I'll just turn it over to Becca to say a few words. Um, go ahead, Thanks, Becca. Justin. Thanks a lot. Um, I appreciate being invited and I love um, being a co-host of this series. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, recreation, more particularly mountain biking, um, is something I could talk about all day long. So thanks for that. Um, I, am, I am the Director of Lands Administration Recreation for the Forest Parks and Recreation Department. I came um, to this work a couple of years ago, um, worked for nonprofits before that and helped um, start the Waterbury Area Trails Alliance. So I live right here in the central Vermont area. Um, I think Forest Parks and Rec has a pretty cool role that we get to play when it comes to outdoor recreation broadly and, and mountain biking more specifically, where um, among many important voices in the state of Vermont, we are one that um, gets to, to talk about and advocate for outdoor recreation and all that it does for Vermont from, from health and well-being to um, 
the ways that it supports our local economy. And I think one of the ways that that um, is translated is, is really through the initiative of VOREC that some of the panelists tonight and others that you'll be hearing from over this series um, are members and are, are really helping the department think about um, what actions can we take together collectively to advance outdoor recreation and mountain biking as one of the ones at the forefront here in Vermont um, that is contributing to what it means to, to really to live here. Uh, we do that through grants. Um, many of you may have seen the press release this week. We have an unprecedented amount of money available to support trail development and maintenance um, on public and private land in the state. We're looking at somewhere around six and a half million dollars uh, being available this year, which is, is really amazing. Uh, we provide technical support. Some of you may um, operate on town forests and have seen the town forest recreation planning toolkit, another tool that we've helped develop. And then around policy, where I wish that we had a success story to, to point to around Act 250, we, we have been working um, sort of plowing that rock up the hill for a couple of years now, and we'll keep leaning into that and trying to make sure that, that we're there for some kind of sustainable solution for, for policy issues related to, to outdoor recreation like, um, like Act 250. And then of course the, the fun side, uh, we're a large landowner in the state. We own and manage around 250,000 acres and we host in partnership with Vimba chapters, places like Perry Hill, my backyard and my favorite, um, Howe Block, Little River, uh, just some really amazing riding right here in central Vermont. And we couldn't do that without the partnership of, of Vimba and the chapters that have developed around Vimba. Um, but that's just a really exciting and important role that we play in addition to that overarching um, recreational point of view that, that we're pleased and, and honored to be able to represent. So that's, that's kind of who we are and we'll be sort of in and out in the way that we um, at serve as panelists or participants in the, the series uh, over the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Becca. That was fantastic. And now, um... Nick from Vimba. Yeah, thanks. And I think Becca sort of teed it up as well. I think a lot of folks know, and we're avid, an active partner with FBR, a lot of folks know Vimba, the Vermont Mountain Bike Association. I think we have a lot of leadership and folks from our chapters involved in these calls. We're a statewide association, 27 chapters throughout Vermont. We serve as the operational backbone, drive advocacy, education, event support, really through those chapters who are the ones on the ground doing the trail building and maintenance. Um, through those chapters, we've helped build and may now maintain over 1,400 miles uh, of trail in the state, and that's growing every year. We, as an organization, we've quadrupled in size over the past couple of years. We're now on track to be over 9,000 members uh, by the end of the year, which is just mind-boggling. It's over well over 1% of the Vermont population, which when you compare to other states that have thriving mountain bike communities, the density of folks that, that are involved in mountain bike in Vermont far exceeds areas like Washington or areas that have grown in the Southeast and things like that recently. So we're seeing a huge boom, um, certainly in participation. We also know that our members are only a fraction of the folks out there on the trails and that we're really building trails for communities now, not just mountain bikers, but for hikers, runners, you name it, um, equestrians getting out there on the trails. So I think our reach extends far beyond those folks that are active um, in the members. Um, the enthusiasm I've seen for the series, I definitely was, you know, interested at the beginning, but also trying to sort of wrap my hands around what this, what this was and would be. But as I began to really understand what Justin was talking about is positioning this as a chance to really reflect and discuss and have a chance to, as a group, to talk about some pretty important issues as we look forward and growing mountain biking sustainably in the state. I think the enthusiasm for this series from folks um, really shows the energy that exists, not just to ride bikes, but to build and maintain really high quality trails, which is just awesome. Um, the pace of that and the quality of trails over the past 10 years has just been, uh, you know, it's grown dramatically. I left the East Coast to move out West about 10 years ago and spent a ton of time in Vermont with my wife's family. And when I came back, it was virtually unrecognizable in terms of how much activity, enthusiasm, opportunities for outdoor recreation. Um, that said, we, we know, um, I can tell from the folks I hear from, there's enormous enthusiasm and pressure to create more and to improve those opportunities. And that's what this series um, is all about. It's, and that growth really shows that now is the is a perfect time 
with experts, with folks that have lived and spent their you know, ton of their time and energy in Vermont building, maintaining incredible trail networks to discuss these important issues related to creating the right social outcomes, thinking about environmental outcomes, really discussing the art of trail building in the future. So it's it's a really perfect opportunity. We're at an inflection point in growth. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to be a part of this. And it's great that we've got our land managers, the Forest Service and FPR closely and so involved. There have been incredible partners with Vimbo. We, we love rolling up our sleeves and figuring out how to just do better with, uh, with the public lands that we have in Vermont, which, you know, we're, we're at very different landscape than we are in places like out west. 80% of our trails are on private land. So there's really a need to, there's a smorgasbord in terms of, of land ownership and land management, but having really these critical anchor partners in FPR and Forest Services is awesome. So um, yeah, just excited to be a part of the conversation um, and, you know, we'll join in here and there, but we've got also a really great slew of panelists that I think will weigh in on, on topics. And I'm excited personally to learn, to learn a ton here. Thanks, Nick. I'll, I'll turn it back that, over to you, Justin. <laughs> the, the roster, uh, when we were, uh, I'll just say as a planning team, when we were trying to put this together, I just kept, it kept hitting me again and again and again, how deep the roster is in Vermont. Um, we've got amazing panelists tonight. We've got amazing pa panelists for the rest of the series. Um, I'm, I'm really looking uh, forward to each and every single one of these. So um, I'm going to start uh, this series off with Steve Kasachik. Uh, Steve is uh, with Imba's Trail Solutions. He was my partner in the White Mountain workshop, putting it together, and has been huge um, as we plan for this. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Steve. Awesome, thank you, Justin. John, you can hit the next slide. Um, and I'll do my quick intro. Uh, Steve Kasachek, I am a project manager with InBetrail Solutions. If it looks like I'm coming to you from a shed, that's because I most certainly am coming to you from a shed. <laughs> Go ahead with that next slide, John. Uh, and we have John Cox helping out today. Um, I am a panelist today. So for the rest of the series, I'll probably be helping facilitate by asking questions. But during this series, John will be asking questions. John Cox is our new education coordinator, um, has been a huge help. So just to remind you, 7 to 8.30 every Tuesday for the next four Tuesdays. You can hang out with us and talk all things trails and mountain biking in Vermont. Tonight, we're talking about plan for social outcomes. Then we're jumping into environmental outcomes. Um, we're getting some awesome trail builders to talk about trail building and maintenance. And then we're going to wrap up with a awesome discussion about the future of mountain biking in Vermont um, and being able to dream big, which I'm really excited for. Um, that was a real popular, we had a round table discussion in the White Mountain workshop, and that was a hit. Go ahead, John. General housekeeping. I'm sure we've all gotten pretty used to Zoom and online the video conferences, but please keep yourself muted. Um, when we get to the question and answer, if you've got a question, type it in chat and maybe John can let you ask it. John might be asking questions if we have a lot backing up. We've got some pre-questions that were, you know, you could submit questions early on and we've had questions roll in over We've been putting this together for a while now. So we've got a list of some questions to jumpstart, but we really hope um, you know, people join in and this can develop pretty organically. Um, we'll be shooting out some surveys. So please help us by filling those out. Um, it's really one of the best ways for us to help improve these offerings. Um, so if you can, please give us some feedback in your two cents. Now we're gonna turn it over and let the other panelists introduce themselves and then we'll jump back to me for some quick hierarching ideas. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey folks, Jeff Alexander. Uh, with Vermont Adaptive, we are the uh, largest statewide adaptive sports charity. Uh, and we operate out of Pico, Sugarbush, Bolton Valley, and Killington in the wintertime. We actually spider over to Suicide Six as well for certain programming. Uh, in the summertime, we have three to four um, paddling fleets that travel the state. We also have two mountain bike fleets that travel the state and we're also uh, hiking as well as um, our veterans program that runs year round is a free program for all veterans. So we, uh, we don't ask folks if they have a disability or not, you're a veteran, you're in. 
And um, just to give you a little perspective of, uh, you know, what we do um, today, we had um, five or six people paddling in Burlington. We had three of those, three other people on the Burlington bike path. Uh, we had a whole crew in, um, in Warren at Blueberry Lake uh, pedaling. And then we also had a, another crew at uh, Silver Lake um, paddling. So that was just one day and it's a Tuesday and it wasn't even great weather. So, uh, you know, we're rocking this summer and uh, we've got a nice sizable grant that allowed us to have uh, kindergarten through 12th grade free this year for anybody who's in that age demographic. So all of our participants are, are free. And I'm really excited to be on this panel. I've been a mountain biker my whole life, I'm still rocking a hardtail. And uh, I've been all over the state and uh, really excited to, uh, to work with Vermont Adaptive and make sure that sports are for everybody and to be able to work with the state and the trail systems and all the good people we have uh, to be able to further the access for our participants uh, throughout the state. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more of what we do um, based on some of the questions, but I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me here. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Chris. Hi, I am Chris. So I wear a lot of hats in the mountain bike world, um, but I'm here tonight with the hat of Pride Rides. So I founded Pride Rides Vermont uh, about three years ago. It's a mountain bike club for LGBTQ plus folks uh, in Vermont. Um, and now we've seen people even from beyond, a little bit of New England mixed in there. Um, Basically, my goal with Pride Rides is to, um, like Jeff said, for his organization, to improve access for the people that it serves. So for LGBTQIA people um, in Vermont, uh, we do that a number of ways by, firstly, we started out with just group rides and um, just offering space and uh, like a safe space within the larger mountain bike community. And um, now we've seen that access kind of expand over time to include things like skills clinics and access to bikes and and um, hopefully a lot more things in the future. Um, so it's been excited to watch it grow from a little group ride seed to, to what it is today, uh, three years later. And I'm excited to be on this call and, and talk a little bit about um, access and, and, and the future of mountain biking in Vermont. Awesome. We are excited. Thank you very much. We've got Zach. All right. Yes, thanks, right. Stephen. Uh, thanks, Justin. Thanks, everybody, for inviting me on here. Uh, honored to, to share some insight from the Randolph-Rochester area. Um, I am a, a founding member of the prior uh, Rasta Club, which has now officially changed its name to the Ridgeline Outdoor Collective. And we are a backcountry ski and mountain bike and hiking group uh, based in the, the southern central Vermont area, uh, primarily Rochester Randolph and down into Pittsfield and a little bit over to Brandon. Um, <clears throat> I come to you guys wearing a couple hats as well. I'm also an event coordinator here. Um, I host a series of, of events, uh, the Braintree Bluegrass Brunch Series. I'm a trail builder as well and uh, community mover and shaker of sorts. Uh, we do quite a bit of work here in Randolph. I'm born and raised here in Randolph. So I, I have a um, strong roots here and really um, it means a lot to give back to the community that raised me. So um, it goes to a deeper level there. Um, we have backcountry skiing um, across Brandon Gap and the Braintree Mountain Forest, which is kind of, you know, probably more of what you've heard of from our club. So we kind of broke the ice with um, some new stuff. We've trailblazed um, a couple new directions with backcountry skiing and now the mountain biking world too with the Velamont Trail. We are the kind of the, um, the center of the brand new and, and soon to be built Velamont Trail. So um, super excited about that as well. Sh share some thoughts and insight there. And um, yeah, just glad to be here and um, hear what other folks have to say, field some questions and have fun. So thank you. Awesome, thank you, Zach. And Abby. Hey. 
Um, yes, I, I echo Zach. I am so grateful to be here and um, able to hopefully share some words of wisdom and um, for all to learn from KT as I am the executive director. My name is Abby Long. Um, I do live up in the Northeast Kingdom where KT is located, but I'm actually zooming in right now from the Adirondacks. Um, has nothing on Vermont though. Um, and you know, the mission of Kingdom Trails is, is to provide education, recreation opportunities by uh, managing, maintaining, building trails to, to foster the health of our community and the surrounding environment, our regional economy even. And, and we do this by offering, you know, now over 100 plus miles of multi-use, all ability trails. Um, but, but truly, and what I'll probably preach about this evening is, is our trails are made possible by 103 private landowners. And that relationship is, um, the most important to Kingdom Trails. And, and that's what I'm, I'm really hoping to, to share about this evening. Um, you know, it's just, I, I see trails as a, a vehicle almost for community development and, um, and, and it's, you know, trails are, are able to coincide with the, the traditional industry up here in the Northeast Kingdom, the forest industry. And there's so much synergy and um, it's part of the new working landscape. I, I didn't dub that term, but, um, but I really hope that, um, you know, trails will just continue to inspire and advance our region, the Northeast Kingdom, which is extremely, um, it's just a challenged region. It has some, some serious social and economic challenges and, and trails are, are driving it right now. And I'm really proud and excited for that future. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take 30 more seconds and just briefly talk about IMBA and where we come from and how we fit in. IMBA, of course, International Mountain Bike Bicycling Association, our mission to create, enhance, and protect great places to ride mountain bikes. So by helping facilitate series like this, we're hoping, you know, everyone walks away a lot more refreshed with a lot of new knowledge and just excited. Um, I've got to admit, I'm a New Englander by birth, Southern New England. Um, but uh, I grew up going to KT, and as I've matured as a mountain biker, I've made it my mission to hit all different places in Vermont, and I'm a big uh, fan of Vermont, and y'all got a lot of awesome things going on. You heard it with all the awesome panelists, um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this. I've been looking forward to it for a while, excited to learn about all the successes y'all have up there. Um, trail Solutions, um, just for those of you who don't understand how we fit into EMBA, we're the professional trail providing consultant side of IMBA. So we do a lot of planning, design, construction, and education. John, as you heard, is our education coordinator for IMBA. Most of my world is planning, design, and construction. So it's always a treat to be a part of workshops like this. Um, go ahead, John, with the next slide. So the next, uh, I think there's three, maybe four slides. We're just going to briefly put, put um, a little bit of uh, guardrails on these whole discussions and try to get a little bit of common language here. So we're talking about high quality trail experiences. Um, when we're talking about trails, we're a lot of times talking about trails that meet goals that we have set out to meet and that are sustainable trails. Go ahead to the next slide. And we'll talk more about goals because that's what this entire workshop is about. It's about different goals. Oh. Too far, John, sorry. <laughs> to remind everyone when we're talking about sustainable trails, there's a couple different parts of sustainability. I know, um, <laughs> sorry. We are, um, we talk about environmental sustainability, obviously a lot. That's the second workshop where we'll dive a lot into environmental outcomes, but environmental sustainability um, is probably the thing that comes to most people's mind when we talk about sustainable trails, you know, trails that drain water, trails that don't have real negative impacts on the landscape or the terrain or the habitat. But there's also the social sustainability and the economic sustainability. Do people wanna ride that trail? Do they wanna steward and maintain that trail? Is there funding, is there a maintenance fund or is there resources to maintain that trail? So those are two important aspects um, of sustainability, not just the environmental side. So when we're you know, thinking about the next couple of workshops and as we're asking questions, you know, especially around the planning side of things where a lot of these workshops are kind of focused on, um, you know, how can we also be planning for social sustainability and economic sustainability? Go ahead to that next one, John. 
Um, and so briefly, um, in the world of recreation planning and design and construction, just the world of outdoor recreation, we've moved a lot from just recreation as a thing, as you know, a hiking trail is a hiking trail, a mountain biking trail is a mountain biking trail. And thinking about just trails as trails to more trails serve a lot of different purposes. And so we can manage trails with outcome focused management. We can think about how we want trails to impact our communities, to impact the people in our communities. You know, what do we want trails to do? And then go about creating the trails that meet those outcomes. And so that's an important thing to be thinking about. That's driving a lot of modern um, trail development. I certainly see it happening in Vermont. So it's a, it's a good thing to be thinking about as we move through these discussions. We got two more. <laughs> Just to set us up, um, trail project development life cycle, you know, there's a whole bunch of gibberish on here. Not that every trail needs to go through all these checklists, but right at the top, we've got planning. You've got feasibility and very high conceptual level planning, you know, and that planning can move all the way through master planning. Planning can involve, probably should involve lots of community engagement and outreach. Um, and then you move into that design phase of a trail project where you're laying that plan sort of on the ground and making it more of a reality. And then obviously we've got construction and post-construction with maintenance, assessment, and stewardship. And if you hit that last slide, John, we'll see a little circle. And we all understand that um, it's a life cycle and it's not just a straight line. Um, and I think especially, um, I come from New England, so I know that we have a lot of uh, historical trails um, in New England. And so, we have trails that might have been developed for one purpose, and we've got to kind of think about, are they still meeting goals? How can we maybe adapt these trails? Or what do we need to do with our management or physically changing the trail potentially to help them meet the goals that we have now, both our community goals and our land manager goals? Um, so that was just a brief, I wanted to go. Sorry if I went a little quick, but I want to get to the meat, the really fun stuff, which is, uh, asking a bunch of these awesome folks some questions. So we will jump into that, John. You have your questions ready. And I will yep. stop talking unless you call on me. All right, time to get into it. Starting off, uh, we have a question to all the panelists. Uh, what are some of your social goals and how do trails help meet those? Are you going to call on us? Uh, whoever wants it first. <laughs> this is to everybody. Ben. Don't be shy. You okay. Here we go. Ladies, ladies first. I'm oh, just going for it. I have to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> I'm queued up. I've got an answer ready to go. <laughs> um, I mean, KT's social go goals are, I stated it like just a second ago. It's right there in our mission. It's to foster the health of our community. Um, and I, I'm just so proud that I serve a trail system that's so deeply intertwined with our local community. I mean, it was our own community members who even banded together to start Kingdom Trails. And, and that was like back in 1994. And, and now we have like 100 plus miles, 103 private landowners, and, and they so generously allow our trails to cross their properties. And, and I truly believe our trail experience extends beyond our network. It's um, into the community fabric and the infrastructure that surrounds it. Um, you know, we have our trail users are driving on our roads, uh, riding on our roads, you know, visiting lodging, restaurants, country stores. Um, they're filling all our parking lots, um, spending tons of money. And, and honestly, they fall in love with our community. And then um, some are even becoming active community members themselves moving to the area and then just holistically uplifting the region, not just one weekend out of the year anymore. Um, and, and I just, I believe, yes, you know, this whole workshop's about planning for those social goals and um, it, planning absolutely definitely helps uh, to ensure that our trails meet those social goals. Um, you know, and myself and the KT team, we don't make a decision without considering how it's going to affect our community. Um, and, and honestly, we've learned all too well very recently that we must have public engagement um, in any planning process. And that 
includes our landowners, um, our neighbors, the business owners, the towns who host us, and the trail users too, um, all must be involved and at the forefront of our minds in order for KT to progress responsibly and, and sustainably. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Abby. I'll jump in real quick on social yeah. goals. Um, you know, in a lot of a lot of times in the, the disability community, um, social isolationism is is a factor. And the fact that the state and the trail systems and work we've been working with many of the systems in the state, we we went up to hang out with Abby and the crew at, at Kingdom and brought a bunch of bikes. And we've had a lot of trail builders try our bikes and now they understand the concepts of um, you know, you don't always have to make a trail easy to make it adaptive, accessible. You just have a couple tweaks here or there. But um, the social outcome for us is that when we get more people out on bikes, then they're not home alone and they're out there with a the crew. And, uh, and that's, that's huge for us is to get folks out to, to play with everybody else and, and to be a part of the community. And uh, we've really you know, been thankful that all the trail systems throughout the state and have really uh, embraced us and, and, and the bikes that we're bringing to those communities. And uh, that's, that's huge for us is getting folks out and about and playing. Great, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think that's huge. I'll jump in here and add one thing. Sure. Please um, do. Yeah, one of the, the main goals as I was beginning down this road with our club and, and developing more trails here in Randolph, I mean, it's a very small blue collar town that's self-sufficient. We don't need an influx of tourists to make our town work, um, but we could use a little extra. So kind of one of the main goals I was trying to achieve with the help of, of our club and all of our volunteers behind us, super strong uh, group of volunteers, is trying to find that balance between adding value and, and social value, economic value based around outdoor recreation without really changing the character of our town, without having a major shift of, of pushing on it too hard or too much. Um, so we can still maintain that, that sense of, you know, what makes, you know, I'll speak for our town, Randolph, Randolph, um, and, and still adding that amazing component, which I feel like we have, um, and we've had great success so far in the last few, few years. Um, and we're, you know, now we're beginning to talk about like, well, what is our cap? You know, how much, how much is enough trail for our small community, both from a maintenance standpoint and from a uh, community impact standpoint, um, down to a neighborhood standpoint you know we've got one trail network uh the the ellis uh town forest that you know winds through and through a neighborhood and how many cars do we want driving down that road um and so we're trying to spread folks out a little bit more and and, and lessen the impacts while trying to find that balance so um we find that important and also sustainable for the long run yeah Awesome. Thank you, Zach. We have a follow-up question for, for Jeff. Uh, what are, what are the typical minor tweaks, uh, that, that you see for, uh, adaptive mountain bike trails and how does planning factor into this? So our, our bikes, um, we all, we have a variety of bikes, um, probably seven, eight different bikes at this point, um, for all different abilities, uh, from recumbent foot pedal bikes to uh, hand cycle bikes, it all depends on the, uh, the injury. But um, a lot of the bikes are uh, 36 to 40 inches wide. Uh, so, so bridges uh, are, tend to be an issue for us. Um, entry, entryways into a trail system uh, and ten, tends to be an issue um, sometimes. And, um, and then off camber, um, heavy off camber turns and switchbacks seem with a lot of the bikes, the physics of the bikes have a higher center of gravity. So um, that's, that tends to uh, have a, a tipping point. Um, we're, we're not sending any athletes out or participants out by themselves, but uh, you know, we'll have a, 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 a sizable crew of volunteers and staff with everybody. But um, those are really the main features that, uh, that we find. Um, everything else is navigable and, and the bikes and the technology and the bikes are, are not far off, uh, you know, same technology as a, as a two wheel bike. So, um, but you know, we've been working with a lot of different chapters and we've been bringing the bikes to chapters so they'll understand. And once you get in the bike yourself, you'll understand it. Uh, in fact, we're at the Stowe Trails Partnership, uh, Katie Hills this Sunday. If you guys want to come out, anybody wants to come out and demo a bike and come check it out. And uh, we worked with Stowe and I saw Rachel's name on there somewhere. And uh, so they're unveiling, uh, you know, a couple of loops that we're going to be working with. And now 
and it's accessible loop um, and not to keep rambling on, but um, a lot of folks when we when we do find uh, trails that are accessible, they're about a, they might be a mile, half mile, and that, that's not a long enough ride for somebody. So that's our next goal is to work and expand those those trail systems and and those trails and those loops. And uh, it's been great to work with everybody. And Jeff, if I could add one thing, what I learned when Vermont, when you and Vermont Adaptive and Kelly Brush Foundation came to KT, it's it's actually not you can't just plan just for the trail. You also have to plan, is there the proper parking for those folks to get out of the car and manage those bikes because they are bigger bikes and, and then access the trail. Um, and then make available on your website, let, let those folks know, um, the, are there great restaurants for them that are easily accessible for them afterwards too. It's the whole experience, not just on the trail. Great point. All right, uh, to, to Chris, uh, what are uh, some social goals for your organization? And uh, can you also speak to, uh, to how to include more diverse stakeholders and community members in the trails planning process? Yeah, so um, my, I mean, all of Pride Rides is, is the social goal is to uh, provide a more inclusive and welcoming space for LGBTQ people within the broader mountain bike community. And so that happens on the trails. That's where the community meets is on the trails, right? And so uh, that is, um, that's where it, it becomes very important. And so to in include more diverse, and I really, I can only speak to like LGBTQI people because I'm within that community. Um, is to invite people out and be intentional about how you're interacting with with them. Like you have to have sort of a baseline knowledge of um, LGBTQIA plus people's experience in life and, and be able to understand some some of how we experience life in order to in order to be a safe and um, welcoming space. And so uh, I think trail networks and, and um, the people who, who make those networks happen have to be intentional about that inclusion. And I've seen a lot of really great progress, you know, in like working with different chapters to host Pride Rides and, and um, you know, some people have really reached out heavy and, and done a lot of work there. You know, we've worked a lot with Stowe Trails also and, I'm on the Milsom board, so I have like a personal fit in there and, and with WADA and Fellowship of the Wheel and um, we've been up to Kingdom Trails too. And so uh, we've worked with a, a lot of different trail networks and seen a lot of um, really great, really great progress. And, and, and um, uh, yeah, I think things are headed in the right direction as far as people understand how to invite and now it's sort of like continuing to do that intentional work and um waiting for people to come because once you see other people like you in a place you know that you belong there um, and you can feel safe in coming out to do that awesome thank you chris kind of going off of uh the, the question with stakeholders uh any any panelist uh, is welcome to hop in on this one uh, who are some of the important stakeholders uh, we see involved early in the plan planning process for successful trails? Do you want me to talk about private landowners now? <laughs> I think this is your shot. Let's hear it, Abby. <laughs> I need to go first every time. I just don't like silence. Um, yeah, so I, the question was the important stakeholders, especially in the, the early process of planning a trail network. Um, and I, and I, it always reminds me of, you know, obviously I wasn't around in 1994 when KT started. Um, it was just a twinkle in my eye. Um, I've only been at the helm for three years, but, um, but those stories are, you know, of, are now, are, amazing trail managers, CJ Scott was like selling maps under a pop-up tent in a parking lot in Eastburg Sports. And 
and the, the founders were business owners and community leaders and of course trail enthusiasts and those folks would go like knocking door to door you know asking their neighbors for permission and um and the, you know private landowners and um and that's who's key and and you know kt has had some recent challenges and and we've made this pledge to um to just you know be more productive in engagement with our landowners through the the creation of you know we have things like a consistent communication and landowner advisory committee um and i i really think you have to have private landowners involved in every conversation and every decision and and you know, with the creation of this advisory committee, we've it, it now serves to facilitate communication uh, between KT and all of our 103 landowners. You know, before, of course, we we celebrated them, we thanked them over and over again, but it was only a one way conversation. It wasn't two ways. Um, so this now provides like an avenue to to meaningfully connect and offer landowners a, a voice. Um, in KT's activities and provide suggestions and advice to our board of directors and um, serves really for, as a forum for sharing feedback and concerns and a space for KT, KT to address any questions. Um, and I just, you know, if, if you think about it, um, I'll, I can name some stats, but, you know, 70% of public trails in Vermont. Um, trails that are actually designated, and, and Becca can probably speak more to this, designated as part of the Vermont State Trail System are on private land. Um, and I think, you know, that's groups such as KT and Vimba chapters, Catamount Trail, VAST, Green Mountain Club. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a stat out there that it's like 12,000 private landowners um, are spanning the entire state. And they're the folks who are, are allowing trails to cross their property. Um, so I, I just, they are, they're gold, you know, we have to keep them close to our hearts, <laughs> respect them. Absolutely. I can All right. That. Yeah, great. Yeah, I would, um, I would totally second what she said. I think that, you know, here in, in our zone, um, we've had an amazing amount of landowner um, engagement. Um, and that really is the backbone of the ability to make trails work. Um, we, I spent countless hours and still spend countless hours with the landowners out walking their land um, and really uh, solidifying those relationships with those landowners to ensure long-term success. Um, in addition, I think uh, forming that relationship with your, with your municipality is incredibly important. Um, connecting with, if you're on a town forest, connecting with your uh, conservation commission and, and forming a super strong relationship there. And then on a bigger stage, um, if you're doing stuff on state land and federal land to form all those, all those super strong re re uh, relationships as well. Um, everything kind of feeds itself and goes hand in hand because once the town knows that you're very solid with the state, that bides well better for the town. Once the landowners know that the town is behind you as well, they kind of, it all sort of goes hand in hand. So it's, it's crucially important to have, I feel and we feel, um, a pretty even balance of stakeholders across all aspects um, to ensure that long-term success. Awesome, thank you, Zach. Looks like... I will just uh, yeah. I'll then answer a question and echo that that's probably why I see so much awesome stuff happening in Vermont, you know, listening to Zach and Abby talk about having a diversity of stakeholders. We're definitely seeing that. Um, obviously, most of my work is nationally, but some of the really successful projects we've seen nationally is because they're bringing in a lot of different stakeholders early on, not just trail users, the traditional hikers and mountain bikers, but bringing in adjacent landowners. A lot of our work is, is on public land, so I can't speak to the private land, but we're bringing in people nearby, getting their input, business owners, um, the local CVB, the local town officials, state folks, um, 
anyone, you know, people on the school board I've had show up, people who are doing programming for kids, even if it isn't related to trail stuff per se, maybe trails can help them with their programmatic goals. Um, folks doing a lot of diversity and inclusion work um, nearby, well, maybe trails can help meet some of their outcomes. So bringing in a lot of different stakeholders early on seems to uh, usually be a, a pretty good way to set yourself up for success. So it's awesome to hear everyone doing that across the state. Awesome. We have a, a good question coming in uh, to Chris and Jeff. Uh, you all uh, leverage trails for social outcomes and inclusivity. What, from your, in your opinion, what should go into planning in terms of facilitating those interactions uh, from facilities to programming? Uh, what, what do you all uh, feel should be in the planning process to make sure communities are included? You want to go first, Chris, or I could, yeah, like, like Abby said earlier, you know, there is a lot that goes into um, the biking um, that we're providing uh, participants. Um, we worked with Millstone to uh, enhance uh, the um, uh, parking spaces for, for handicapped parking spaces, and we've worked with a few other uh, organizations, but um, just an overall thought process of who's going to be using, um, you know, everybody who's going to be using that that area. Uh, we, we noticed that, you know, we've, we've talked to a lot of people and we've all been on the, uh, in conversations where when somebody gets a grant, they're like, okay, we're going to build the gnarliest, baddest trail out there. It's going to be awesome. And, uh, and most of the people at the trail system were like, yeah, let's do this. And then, but if you think about it, you build that green trail and you're going to foster that next generation rider. And you're also going to foster that, that community that we serve and uh, that we're, we're, you, uh, we're working with. Um, and that's not only the, you know, the three wheel bikes, we're, we're, we uh, do a lot of two wheel biking and we serve about 60% of the, the children we work with are on uh, in, in the cognitive uh, realm. So um, it's, it's space for everybody and, and trying to just wrap your head around that and, and how's this area uh, going to work when you, when you come in and, and just to jump off for, for skiing, but you know, we were, we have uh, quiet rooms at uh, a couple of our lodges. Uh, skiing is very hectic and when you're coming in and trying to get all your gear on and everything um it's 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 a challenge and some uh, some of the children um we we move everybody to the choir room it's a fabulous opportunity to slow everything down get everybody ready to go and it, it enhances the experience so it's all about the experience so just taking in a lot of these things into account um into the planning and the back end planning is, is huge for for the community and for anybody in new england i mean we're one one gas tank away from one quarter of the nation's population. So everybody can come play here. Awesome, thank you. Chris? I would um, echo a lot of that in being like, um, I mean, with, with Proud Rides, there's sort of like two aspects that I've run into. And, and one being that sometimes you, or a lot of times we see a lot of new riders, people who haven't either have never been on a mountain bike or are, are sort of just getting into mountain biking. Um, and so having access to good beginner trail networks or like good, um, well signed and, and um, beginner level riding is really um, important. And, and so that, I mean, and that is more than just for, LGBTQIA people, that's for anyone coming into mountain biking, right? And so, but when you're looking at inviting more people in, that's a really, that's a, a very important part. Um, and I think we we do, we have like started to do a really good job with that. And, and, and like Jeff said, sometimes we get the grants and we're like, yeah, biggest, baddest, like most technical terrain out there, which is super fun. I love it, but um, isn't, isn't necessarily accessible for everyone. And so, um, beginner trails. Uh, and and signage and stuff like that. Um, and then the other aspect you can't, I mean, with, with LGBTQIA people, the, one of the biggest things is you, like, is the feeling of welcome and safety. And so the trails are spanning all across Vermont. And um, from, from my perspective, uh, sometimes there are certain communities that we feel more welcome in than others in Vermont. And that's um, just sort of the, the, the nature of politics sometimes and um, viewpoints. And, and so it, as like organizations and chapters, it's a really important um, to, to 
create that obviously safe space. So signify this trail network is, is um, safe for queer people, you know, and, and, um, and, and stand for that, you know, and, and make that very clear. And that is hugely important in, in that accessibility. Um, and sometimes I think it's really easy to not see that if you're not a part of, of that community. So that's a very important aspect. Awesome. Are there any specific programs, events, or initiatives that you've seen be successful for engaging uh, traditionally excluded groups? I, so if I could just jump back yeah. in again. <laughs> yeah. um, so out, outside, I, I was looking at this question um, the other day and, and one, one organization that I think it does a really good job with this is um, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. So I worked for them for um, a, a season and it was so much fun. I worked in both uh, Channing County and down in Woodstock. And the kids, the, the youth that I worked with, like some of them were super into trails, super into mountain biking, and some like literally probably had never dug dirt before. Like it was just, you know, and so there was such a wide, um, widely diverse population um, hanging out and working for BYCC and so that's and yeah I, I, I love the work they do and, and I noticed that or thought of them immediately on this other question. Awesome thank you Chris. I had a follow-up question for you. You're on the hot seat right now Chris. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of pride rides from a group ride to more than more than just a group ride? And what other activities are you doing now? Yeah, so um, so three years ago, it was just um, about about group rides, and and immediately they were a huge hit. I mean, like our first rides saw fifteen to twenty people, which went as in my experience of leading group rides at like Millstone, that was a giant group, and so um, I was very excited about that. And and each each week or each month, there'd be like new people, and and um, people that were really excited to, to ride bikes with, with other queer people. Um, and so from there, I just got really, really stoked on, on um, increasing access and, and just making, making pride rides into something that could really serve my community. Um, and so I decided to make it a nonprofit, uh, an official nonprofit started with the state and then did a, the federal nonprofit status um, which we were granted this this last year, um, and then started raising money through different organizations. Um, I work at Vermont Bicycle Shop, and um, my friend Darren, who owns the shop there, ha helped me build the website and and get a lot of all that going. And I run a lot of the operations out of the shop there, um, and now. Um, working on getting a whole fleet of bikes for Pride Ride events and um, and hopefully eventually a, a lending style library where people can who don't have bikes or don't have access to bikes can borrow one from Pride Rides to ride. Um, you know, in the future plans, uh, the, the, there's no ceiling. I, I get really excited if I had like all of the money um, it, it, to, to do that. I have so many ideas, but um, some of the things we got to do this year were, um, so we just did some skills clinics with Stowe Mountain Bike Academy. Um, and that was really cool and have some different, different skills type things and more, uh, um, broadening the ride availability. So looking at more like immediate intermediate rides to go along with the beginner rides and, and just expanding that, um, that reach and uh, including that reach up and down the state. So right, we've been a lot in the like Chinon County, Central Vermont area, but trying to reach more ride leaders down in Southern Vermont and really um, be able to offer offer these um, resources to LGBTQI people across the entire state. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Opening up uh, a question to you, any plant panelists that wants to answer, how can collaborative planning help mitigate social visitor 
uh, social and visitor conflicts of future trails. I'm going to call on someone. Good question. <laughs> Abby. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, Sounds like you're up, Zach. I know, right? Um, to mitigate problems, I mean, it's, you know, from a, a firsthand experience in our trail network and our users, um, we haven't really seen it so much in the mountain biking world as we have the backcountry ski world because we have more uh, trail users that come to Brandon Gap and the Braintree Mountain Forest. I'm sure you've, um, <clears throat> you guys may have heard over the winter of the altercation at Braintree Mountain Forest that we had to uh, mitigate. Um, we worked closely with the landowner, the abutting landowner, um, tried to mitigate stuff even before it happened, but sometimes as a trail organization, your hands are sort of tied with what you can do and where. And that was a product, that situation was a product of us kind of, our hand was a little bit forced. And so we tried our best to mitigate it. <clears throat> Excuse me, after the fact, it worked out great. The landowners are very pleased and we carry on with, um, with the backcountry skiing access there. Um, I think it gets back to um, the collaboration. The, the more that we can collaborate and, and keep lines of communication open with the conservation commissions that oversee um, the town forests and the towns and the state, you know, monitoring the trail usage um, and kind of gauging how much we're promoting stuff as well. The more we promote, the more folks will come. So again, trying to find that balance of of how much is enough without pushing too hard. Um, so trying to almost mitigate it before you even get to the problem um, of over usage. And so hopefully we are doing a good job in, in, our, in our area. And um, I guess time will tell a little, little bit, but um, you know, we're trying hard to, to be transparent, to be, um, try and stay in front of things too, the best that we can. If, if we see something coming, we'd rather um, try and face it, address it and, and try and move on from it opposed to uh, trying to stuff it under the rug and hope that it, it goes away. Um, and I think that's a challenge sometimes. So um, we're trying hard and, and we're gonna keep doing what we're doing and hope for the best, so. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Does anyone else have anything to add for planning to help mitigate social and visitor conflicts? I mean, I agree with Zach. You just have to have everybody involved at the table, um, whether they're a mountain biker or not, a trail user or not, um, the community members, the private landowners, but also, um, the, you know, the naysayers even. Um, also the trail users, I mean, everybody, I, I, I mean, every single stakeholder. And, and we, I mean, I feel like there's a million examples I could pull from like our current e-mountain bike review process, which I don't wanna talk about e-mountain bikes right now, but um, you know, we just completed an amazing capacity. <laughs> we just completed an amazing capacity study. I actually see Drew Pollock Bruce is, is on here. And um, we became best friends for the past year and a half. And he led us with, with his um, firm, SE Group, he led Kingdom Trails through the most collaborative, most um, public engagement process I could have ever wished for. Um, and it wasn't just inviting all stakeholders to the group, it was also inviting them in many different ways. So there were online surveys, there was an in-person vision, visioning, visioning session. Um, and then COVID hit, so a lot of things, you know, we, our focus groups that we were gonna have in person, you know, got switched to small group Zooms. Um, but then we actually were able to start visiting people one-on-one. -on -one and, um, you, you know, it was just this like multifaceted way of reaching out to everyone and making sure that everyone felt included and validated and listened to. Um, you know, we had like over a thousand something responses to online surveys, um, over 200 attendees at, at, a, at a, um, a forum, which in the Northeast Kingdom, nobody 
to over 200 people showing up to something is amazing, you know? Um, and I'm just so grateful that we had the leadership of Drew and the SE group help help us do that. And it, and it taught me whatever review process uh, or, or, you know, planning process we go through in the future, that's our tactic. That's the approach that we're gonna take. Abby, could you elaborate on how uh, through that process, you balanced different stakeholder desires um, and maybe some of the conflicts that might have uh, arose through that process? Yeah, um, well, that capacity study was because there were conflicts going on. I mean, KT doesn't own a single parking space. Uh, we, all, we are so dependent on our private landowners, not only for trails, but also for our parking. Um, you know, the amount of numbers that we're seeing on our trails were um, negatively impacting our community with, you know, unsafe traffic flow and, and pedestrian crossings and, and just the stress and pressure that were on our private landowners was not sustainable. Um, and so that capacity study really, you know, helped us find um, recommendations, solutions that were um, appropriate and okayed by by all the stakeholders. However, we, I think, I mean, maybe I know Bruce is an, or, sorry, Drew is in a panelist, but, but we did. We always, you know, in those surveys, we we asked, "Are you a trail user? Are you a private landowner? Do you live within five miles of the Kingdom Trails or twenty five miles of Kingdom Trails?" And we you know, made sure in um, all the results that we were distinguishing between those groups because yes, the folks who maybe lived closer and were private landowners, we wanted to know what specifically their thoughts were. And they probably did have more weight and clout in some of our, in the solutions and recommendations that, that Drew had. I would just say what you said, Abby, about having all the different means to have people engaged was, is the number one thing because um, different tools work for different folks. And so meeting them at the grocery store or you know, at the community events that aren't around mountain biking, if you can show up there and have some information um, kind of anywhere you can get in front of folks with, with all the different means is, is the way to, to do that. Um, and uh, it's not always easy, I think, uh, but that's, that's what you can do is just be there. And I'd like to add to that too. Um, I think now more than ever, as we all love trails, we all love more, 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 more. Um, we're at the beginning of, of, I feel, and a few of us feel, um, there's going to be more pushback. There's going to be more people and naysayers that, that start to speak up as more trails push further deeper in, um, there's going to be some more conflict. And so I think it, it just, it, it increases the importance of being transparent, being available, um, facing those hard conversations over and over again. Um, and I think that we're gonna see it across the board, not just here in Vermont, but in other areas. And um, so I think it's just, it's, it's the utmost importance that we all um, do the best we can there. And KTA is, um, is a shining example of, of coming out the other side you know, admitting that, you know, they did something wrong and they really are addressing it the right way. And I, I applaud them for the work they're doing. Um, and so, <laughs> great job up there. Yeah, it's awesome. been really awesome following that, uh, that process. And I just wanted to harken back to what you said earlier, Zach, and I think you were uh, noting there a little bit, you know, coming together as a community from the beginning and being very intentional about what you want those trails to be. Like some of the first questions I might ask a group of stakeholders, like, do you wanna bring a bunch of people to town? If you do, we have to think about these trails in a different way and the infrastructure that's gotta support these trails. You know, if we're talking about some community trails for the folks and the kids here in this community and maybe drawing some folks in, then we might think about the trails and what we actually want those trails to look like in a different way. But having those open and honest conversations really early on with with all the important folks, um, I think we've seen, you know, that leads to a lot of successes further down the road, like everyone's kind of been saying. So one good point. Steve, a follow-up question uh, from, from a more of a national perspective. 
how can we plan for successful community trails that meet social goals? Uh, you kind of touched on it uh, just now, but could you elaborate a little bit more? Maybe some tactics or, or uh, think, things that you've seen that have been successful in different communities. Uh, I think we've we've been hitting on a lot of them. The idea of bringing together a diverse group of stakeholders early on is probably one of the big ones. Um, lots of different community engagement. I think Drew made an awesome argument for a variety of different community engagement and stakeholder engagement. We've been doing more and more um, community engagement in a whole variety of ways. I think COVID forced our hands with a lot of projects to be more creative, but uh, in the long run, it's been able, you know, doing big webinars, doing story maps, collecting data that way, the old town hall meeting style, um, just all the meetings we can and all the data we can collect early on is uh, some of the big stuff we've seen early on. Um, groups forming collectives and partnerships, um, seeing really diverse and strong partnerships, not just between trail users, but you know the local business association, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, or whatever the uh, equivalent is, um, seeing those come together with the trail organizations to help put on events and get the right marketing out in front of people and, and present it in the right way. Um, and I wanted to, this may be a little off topic, but harken back to some of the stuff I heard from like Chris and, and Jeff definitely around um, beginner trails, right? Just accessible trails and accessibility comes in a lot of different fashions when we're talking about natural surface trails. Um, but uh, I think Chris talks a lot about signage. You know, this is huge. We have come to realize this, especially as in, but we have shifted away, you know, from a lot of emphasis on gnarly and backcountry and epics and yada yada to more trails close to home being our latest um, rallying cry, whatever the heck we call it. Um, so, you know, the idea that the trails that make big impacts on communities are those accessible trails that are very close to people. I see a lot of that awesome work happening around this state. Um, but that's definitely, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest successes that trails can do is getting them close to people and making them more accessible, not just the trail itself, the tread and whatever, but signage, having really good signage and putting it out in different forms so that people can find the information so they feel comfortable and have a relative feeling of safety. I'll never say the woods is safe, but a relative feeling of safety out in the woods. Um, I think that's huge. Yeah, Steve, real quick on that, that topic. Um, you know, we find that we bring a lot of people to trail system, but it's kind of uh, daunting. It's kind of overwhelming that if you're a first time biker, you come to a trail system and you see this gap in the trees and they, and they say, okay, go through that gap in the trees. You have no idea what's on the other side. And so, you know, we kind of, we came up with an idea a couple of weeks ago that, you know, maybe a lot of trail systems throughout New England and, and Vermont would get a child to actually wear a GoPro chesty and, and ride that trail and narrate it. And therefore it's a child speaking to another child when, a, when we have a younger demographic of watching that video saying, wow, that little boy or that little girl is doing that trail and talking about this and then watching that trail. And then that's gonna open doors for a lot of people that, that you know, visual learners right off the bat so um, that could be a great way to get more people on trails. I mean, I know my wife right now, if she, if she watched a video of somebody on a trail with a little kid narrating it, she'd be like, okay, I'm in, let's go. You know, so I think that can expand um, just everybody, just the participation in general. So um, just want to throw that out there for anybody. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add to that too. I think that the youth, um, those easier trails, accessible, well-signed trails, um, it is just the the like the paved path in a way for kids to get into the sport and that's really the the long-term sustainability for this sport is getting the youth involved and continuing that encouraging that um our club just got a very nice after school grant we bought a trailer filled it with bikes we expanded our camps we have paid directors now for our camps and stuff the camps are selling out like within an hour um, and so it's amazing to see these kids come out and just the joy in their eyes from kids from like my son is five years old and he rode for two and a half hours on Sunday with a group of like 10 year olds and they had a great time. And so I think, you know, that that's another stakeholder in a different sort of sense, like the youth. 
um, here in Randolph, we have a, a brand new outdoor trail hub that's in a building that we had renovated. And I brought in a couple um, shop owners to open up the gear house in Randolph. Super successful first year bike shop. Um, they can't get any bikes. They've sold them all, but they're doing really well. But to see kids when school lets out at 2.30, at 2.45, there's a group of young, you know, middle school and elementary school kids hanging out on the front lawn. You know, that's the place to be. They want to be there. They want to be around that vibe. That vibe is contagious. And those kids get involved, their parents get involved. And, and that's just, that's a win all day long for the community, for the businesses and for the longevity of the sport too. So go youth. Yeah. I, speaking nationally, I've got a story that I tell. They're in almost every PowerPoint. It's a generic story, but it basically goes like we build trails somewhere and they're great progression. So like building off the idea of accessible trails, having really good progression in trails is another awesome trend that we see happening, you know, being very intentional about that progression. Build a set of trails. I come back a year later because I'm traveling through and I end up like following some like 13 year old kid um, down a trail and we get down to the bottom, you know, we're shredding for a little bit. And I, I always ask them, how long have you been riding bikes? And the answer is always like a year, like a year or less. And it's just amazing to just see how, how kids can progress and how anybody can progress. But kids really, when you give them that really intentional purpose-built um, series of progression through trails, but that starts at that accessible levels. That's awesome. I'll add one more. We just had a 12-year-old, a brother of a very solid 16-year-old. He's 12 years old. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he rode every solo. He rode every single single track trail we have in Randolph solo at 12 years old. Climbed like 6,000 vert, uh, 40 plus miles, uh, like blown away. Absolutely. The community's blown away. It was in the Herald, the paper and stories like that just like <laughs> keep me going. So <laughs> super cool. On the on the subject of uh, different categories of trails or ex uh, experience levels, uh, this is open to anyone. Uh, how do you do? You feel like the ratio of beginner to intermediate to expert is adequate uh, with a high uh, with a high rate of inclusion? Uh, if not, uh, where do you see the ratio lacking? That's a good question. I mean, personally, um, my personal ride, I think everything's great. It's all good. I'm cool with everything the way it is. Um, Work-wise, I think we could definitely use some some lower level terrain. Um, and that, that that's even at ski resorts too right now. You know, some of the uh, some of this, the resorts and the access to the resorts and, you know, there's no magic carpet here or there. And, you know, you're, you're trying to get a, a child who's, you know, off the lift and things of that nature. But um, I definitely think that, you know, for our business and, and the folks that we serve and, and getting more folks to come up to the state of Vermont to play, we could have a little bit, a little bit more of a, a lower level loop, you know, lower level to medium level loop, um, just at, at a lot of the systems. Cause I've traveled the state and hit a lot of these systems. And, you know, that's just, just as for the business that I, that I work with. Yeah, absolutely. Is anyone hey. else? Oh, sorry. Kill yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, does anyone else have something to add? I would say, uh, like, tagging on to the, to having more beginner loops is in, and like circling back to signage. One of the, a really big thing or something that could work really well is if we had more, um, like, more of that mapped out. So, so like having a suggested route for differing levels. So, a lot of times it's up to the rider or the user to like, design their own route wherever they go to a to a trail system and be like all right i'm looking at these greens maybe or blues or reds i don't know and they're different with every single trail there's like not a lot of consistency about what actual level you're riding and so having sort of like a, a resource where a trail network or um or through like bimba or whatever would have hey this is a really great beginner level trail and here's what it looks like like an explanation or like jeff said a, a 
a video of a of a child riding it. That's amazing. I did like um, so this year at Millstone we did a race series, kind of like. I borrowed the idea of Catamount. Thank you, Catamount. <laughs> and we we did designed three loops in through the through the town forest, and um, they're like the best signed trail loops that we have. And it's been a really great resource at the bike shop to be like, hey, you're coming to visit, check out this trail. It's already signed. Follow the little gnomes. You'll you'll be out there for like three ish miles, you know. And and so having um, a grouped resource like that could be could be really valuable. Can I just um, add, now that we're talking, you know, we've brought up like youth involvement and signage and suggested routes, you know, I think I, I wanna just like go one step further and um, here we are, you know, that to me all falls under like education efforts and, um, and I think to go to coincide with all of those efforts because I agree with all of them, but I do think Vermont needs to, and I know Nick is having this conversation, um, but has to have a, a pretty serious uh, discussion and agreement on adopting a code of conduct. Um, KT um, is part of a mountain bike collaborative called the Bo Bike Borderlands, which falls under the Northern Forest Center. So it's the um, main northern borders of Maine all the way to the Adirondacks and um, and we combined Bike Borderlands created Ride with Gratitude. And I, and I believe the goal of Ride with Gratitude is to start getting adopted um, more regionally, the whole Northeast, maybe even, who knows, it could go national. But um, I think if we could, you know, the bike shops making those suggested routes um, or as our, the kids programs um, that get out there and, you know, slap it on all of the signage that's out there. If, if there was something similar to ride with gratitude, it it you know just helps hold people accountable because of you know behaviors are that's I mean to be super candid that's the challenges that KT's had with with the number of trail users we've had some uh, behavior incidences out there and um, we just I think to what would pair nicely with all those other efforts is. Um, respect this gift, respecting nature, care, care for each other and be the example. Those are the pillars of Ride with Gratitude. And I think if we can all collectively, you know, start till we're blue in the face, just <laughs> promoting that, um, I do think we'll see a big shift in mountain biking use, um, the way the environment's treated and um, the way our private landowners um, and each other are treated. Um, and if, especially if we can immerse it into our youth right now, you know, they'll just grow up thinking that's, you know, second nature to, to be respectful. I'm not saying that they already aren't, but just we'll really drive it home. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, a good question uh, coming in. How can we work together to ensure our existing trail networks still meet our community and societal goals in 10 years. Uh, and maybe we could also talk about how our social goals have changed in recent history and then look ahead of how we can maintain that. Give you guys a second to think on that one. I think we started talking about it just a few minutes ago. It kind of is in um, in the idea of inviting the youth to participate. You know, the in, in ten years, um, you know, hopefully most of us will still be mountain biking, but also our kids and or or like other people's kids will be also. And and so I think we have to be intentional about inviting them to participate on all the different levels first by riding, um, then by like trail work. And um, even, you know, many of them, I think, you know, if you look at like our, our boards on the chapters and stuff, you don't see a lot of like super young people would be really, you know, in their, maybe you're like early twenties at the, at the, at the youngest, but um, you know, so just like inviting, inviting the youth out and, and making sure to like pass, pass that torch. Great yeah, point. Think, Great point. I think it could be too that um, there's a lot of crossover athletes too. So you got a lot of folks that are skiing, 
they're coming to Vermont to ski, but they're coming to Vermont to bike. So, you know, what kind of messaging can you hit them with in the off season as well to, uh, you know, either a, what, you know, Abby was saying where, you know, it's, it's a code of conduct, uh, but it's also information about, you know, trail systems and what's opening, what's not um, longevity of the, uh, of the program itself. And, you know, just, uh, you know, if we, if we do go for the code of conduct, I think there'd be, you know, uh, be nice because your mom could be riding here too today. You know, so that could be a good tagline, but, uh, you know, since everybody's riding these days, um, but I definitely think there's a crossover between um, both winter and summer and, and how do we, we address that or how do we, we hit those demographics and, and kind of uh, almost mold that together in, in a way of uh, respecting the land, respecting the property and, and uh, you're coming here to play. Um, so, but you want to make sure that, you know, you can play for the future. So I think there's, there's some messaging that we can kind of push out you know, as a group or as a state in that respect. And then to mm -hmm. add to that, I think it's super important that we all take that responsibility and lead by example everywhere we go, everyone we run into, you, you know, you, you take that extra second to be polite, to say hello, to talk them up, to use that chance to like that face-to-face, -face. you know, if I'm in the Branch Mountain Forest Trailhead, I try and talk to everybody I can, you know, hey, is it your first time here, this, that, the other, same thing. Um, and I know that other folks with our club do, do too, but I think it's super important to a use our our platforms. We all have some pretty uh, powerful online platforms that have tens of thousands of folks that follow us. Um, we got arguably more feedback from some of the posts that I made over the winter in response to the way that we act. Um, to the Braintree incident than we have from like any other post. So I think that people really, they, they really are receptive to it. They like to hear it. They like to be reminded of it. Um, you can't please everybody, but it's, it's definitely one of those like lead by example, um, show the youth, you know, the right way to operate. Don't be a, you know, don't be a jackass, you know, be responsible and have fun at the same time. But, uh, but trying to lead by example, use our platforms and, try and do do the right thing for sure <clears throat> we've talked about uh some separate groups here you know skiing hiking uh has anyone seen a successful uh program or initiative to uh, blend different user groups in in the vermont region yeah right. um I think there's some great state level organizations. The Vermont Trails and Greenway Council um, has both motorized and non-motorized groups. Um, and we, we know actually our voices are stronger united. Um, there's also the Vermont Trails Alliance as well, similar um, efforts. But yeah, I, I, we, you know, the heads of those organizations work or of trail groups are working really well together. We're always in communication with each other. Um, I know Kingdom Trails, the vast, the snow machine trails, you know, are actually, you know, they go right through our network and are some of our main corridors to help us connect our areas of the trail. Um, and we have a great relationship. I also know in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, our communities are, are made up of both, the, both trail users, motorized and non-motorized. And we, we always have to, our, you know, our signage speaks to both of them, you know, be cautious. There's multi-use going on out here. Um, so I, again, it just all falls back on communication. I think for us, it's nice because a lot of um, our membership is roughly split between summer users and, and winter. Um, so summer, uh, join um, our club and Vimba and winter they join our club and Catamount Trail Association and there's a lot of crossover of backcountry skiers are also mountain bikers and hikers um, and so our message you know kind of resonates very well with both in our in our group on a small scale um, and we try and hold events that appeal to everybody I mean COVID, we kind of lost a year, but we're trying to get back on track. Um, you know, trying to be as as in, as inclusive as we can and welcoming to all. As um, to to Chris's point, uh, is super important. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we can all continue to try and do better there for sure. So. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I think that summarizes it, right? That was a great uh, final answer. Uh, we're, we've reached the end of our time uh, together this evening. Uh, we only had a limited amount of time. We had some great questions coming in, uh, but we have future sessions and we'll, we're going to get into more topics and get to dive into to some of these questions that you all asked that'll transfer over to, to the next section. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Justin and Steve to wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Jeff, Chris, Abby, and Zach for being on today's panel. Um, I think we had some awesome discussions going on there. Ho hopefully everyone enjoyed. Um, with the rainy weather, it's probably easier to sit inside. So not uh, praying for rain every Tuesday, but hoping you can join us every Tuesday from here on out. Um, next week, we'll be talking about environmental outcomes. So we'll definitely get a little bit more into that environmental side of sustainability where we're we're asking um, some of those fun questions. So please think about those questions. You will get a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, we'll send you again, we'll send you the recording. Um, we'll remind you with the Zinc, Zinc Zoom link. It's getting to be the end of the day for me. Um, and, uh, and have a couple questions in there. Um, we'd love some of your feedback. So thanks for joining us. Looking forward to three more and um, have a great Tuesday evening.